Hi and welcome to Poly Originals with Fiona Abel Smith. So for today's project I thought we'd do a nice fun and easy little black and white kaleidoscope cane and I thought we'd do a nice hollow pendant so I can show you one of the techniques I use for doing that. This is a technique that um, certainly I came up whilst experimenting by myself. I have no idea whether other people do it this way um, but as far as I'm concerned it is something I discovered for myself so hopefully it'll be an interesting way for you to do it as well if you haven't done it this way before. But the other thing I'm doing, this video is called Compare and Contrast, a hollow polymer clay pendant because you've got the contrast between the blacks and the whites but I am also going to compare six different brands of clay. Now this is before because I've been asked quite a lot why I use um, particular brands of clay in my videos. The simple answer is I use whatever I have to hand but I also know from experience that I've caned with all of them and I use them all for different projects so it'll be interesting to do exactly the same project with all six brands and to see what the difference is. I'm not going to talk a lot about colour um, and I'm not going to talk a lot about the clays as in the technical part of the clays. The colour, if you want to learn more about that, there is a book and I'm going to talk about that when we actually get on to mixing the colours later on in the video. But for anything technical, I know I've said this before but I will say it again, anything and everything you want to know about polymer clay, just go to the Blue Bottle Tree. Ginger Davis Allman is just amazing with all the work she does and all the tests she does and all the outcomes she shows on everything to do with polymer clay. I refer people to her constantly because any question you've got, you can nearly always be guaranteed that uh, Ginger has the answer in one article or another on her site. So, no, no further ado, I'm just going to ask one quick question, so it's a bit of a teaser. This is one of the brands of clay that I'm using. Now I know some of you reckon you can tell a brand of clay simply by looking, so that's going to be my question. Which brand of clay do you reckon this one is? And it'll become clear at the end when I do the summing up. Right, let's get started and let's start with the equipment we need for today's project. So the equipment we need for today's project is pretty standard, so nothing too much to go out and find. Some form of polymer clay blade, a knitting needle or something just to smooth over the edges. This happens to be a four millimeter um, knitting needle, a craft knife, some form of roller. This roller is particularly for use with polymer clay. A little bit of liquid clay, um, the sort that matches with the brand of clay you are using. Um, I've just decanted this into a little pot just to make it for ease of use. Going to need a couple of size cutters. One will be the size, the larger size that you're going to do your finished piece in. And this one is just under two inches in diameter. And then a slightly smaller one, um, but one that's going to give a, a decent um, width or band on the inside there and that'll make sense as we do um, we get closer to that bit. And this is about one and a half inches in diameter across there and because my cutters don't have a right and a wrong side they're both sharp I just have a little bit of a board that I just use which protects my hands when I'm using the cutters. Some form of um, parchment or baking sheet um, wax paper, grease, grease proof paper, so something like that just that we can put our piece on and move it around and manipulate it on that. If you decide you want to sand your piece afterwards then I would use wet dry sandpaper and I will do mine 240 grit, 600 grit, 1000 grit, 1500 grit and up to 2000 and I do my sanding by filling up a basin or a bowl of water um, and a little bit of detergent or washing up liquid in that and then I will put sandpaper, with, I'll always wear rubber gloves so you need rubber gloves as well and then I put the sandpaper over my fingers like that and actually put the piece um, around that. Depending on whether you put your hole in your bead before or after you can either use one of these beading needles which has got a nice sharp point on one end or of course you can drill it afterwards. And today I'm using these tiny little screw heads as the findings to put in my finished pieces and you can find these quite easily online. Then just look under jewellery screws or something like that and they should come up. Today I'm using a measuring sheet to cut out precise amounts of clay but that's purely because I'm doing comparisons between the different brands of clay but if you want to use this this is available from www.printablepaper.net and then you need some form of mould to put your cut out circles on. This is one of the Sculpey 
forms it works really well and that's the one I'm going to be using today however if you've got an old spent light bulb you can just add a bit of polymer clay on the bottom of that then that makes a really good dome as well any small round dishes you've got which are nicely domed and um, backs of some spoons work so just something that's going to give you a nice form and if you haven't got one of those then of course cutting off the bottom of a drinks can is a well used and trusted method however please be very careful I actually sand my cut off bits so I don't cut my fingers you can also just wrap them in tape so you don't cut yourself and they're good both of the domes put on the inside but obviously they have got a nice dome on this side so you can use those as well and then to bake your pieces some form of tile to bake them and I will always without fail tent the whole of my pieces in foil I think that's it for um, the equipment we need so let's go on to the clay so these are the six brands I'm going to be comparing and contrasting today. Um, Kato Polyclay, Sculpey Primo, Sculpey Souffle, Cernit, Fimo Soft and Fimo Professional. Now these are all clays that I use myself. They all have slightly different properties um, and some clays I use for one thing, some clays I do for another. But I thought it would be quite fun just to show you a few things that I've learned myself over the years from personal experience. But also to make the same cane with all of them and then see how they compare. Because I'm, I'm pretty happy caning in any of them. Um, they say they all have slightly different properties, but I'll show you those as we go through. So one little anecdote I will tell you, one of the first things I learned about the differences in polymer clay was when I first started off, and it was the first time I'd been to one of the big international um, polymer clay meets with amazing international tutors. And I was very new and sort of quite nervous and not very sure of myself because I was new to this whole polymer clay thing. And I was working in Fimo Soft. It was the only clay I'd ever worked in. So of course I took Fimo Soft to the workshops that I was doing. And one of the tutors who I love, very well respected, um, said we had to mix some colours and then mix a lighter shade of the same colours. And she said to do that, to just mix half of your colour and half white, equal proportions. And I sat there thinking, well, that's not right. Because if I mix equal portions of Fimo Soft with white, I'm going to get not that much difference from the um, initial colour. So I didn't say anything because I was very unsure of myself. Went back did my normal thing that I do with Fimo Soft, so it was six parts white, about one part of the colour to get a nice even shade. Sat there thinking, well, okay, but what's everyone else doing? Looked around, saw that they had all made a fairly similar shade to me, but using one part white and one part colour, but using Primo. And that was the first time I realised that there is a huge difference in the clays in how you mix them. This book wasn't out at the time, so I couldn't have referred to this. But this book is um, Polymer Clay Colour Inspirations. It's by Lindley Hunani and Maggie Maggio. As far as I'm concerned, these two are gurus when it comes to um, colours with polymer clay. And the work that Maggie has done with colour mixing and sort of spreading the word is fantastic. Now, the difference in the clays is actually mentioned in this book with loads of um, terminology, information, how to mix the clays, how to get all your colour inspirations. It really is the most amazing book. Um, so if you've ever had problems with your colour, mixing colour or anything else, I can thoroughly recommend this. And no, I'm not getting sponsored. I just happen to know it is a very, very good book. However, just for a very quick, um, for what we're doing today, just, just for my own personal experience, I'm just going to show you what happens when we mix the clays in these particular colours. Because I thought it would be quite handy um, just to have a visual reference for you. So I've got equal proportions of the white and black in all six of these. And then I've mixed them together. So in the Kato, what we have when you mix the two together is that, so that's a nice grey colour. In the Primo, what we have, not dissimilar, comes out with that. In the Souffle, you've actually got quite a lot darker. So you'd need to use a lot more white when you're mixing a lighter colour than the dark when you're in using the Souffle. So the Cernit, again, pretty similar. Um, to those ones. And now we've got the Fimo Soft. And if I bring this one over, you can see this is perceptibly darker than all the others. And the Fimo Professional, again, very similar, very much darker than all the others. So if you're trying to mix a light colour in Fimo Soft or Fimo Professional, then you need to use a lot more proportion of white than you do to your dark colour. So I then thought, okay, let's do the reverse. So I did four parts of white to one part of the black. So on the Kato, we've 
got this nice light colour, so you can see a nice difference there between the light and the dark. On the Primo, lighter still, but again a nice difference there, you can see a nice difference between the two. The Souffle, again darker than these two, which goes along with the fact that it was darker when we mixed those two together, so again to make, um, you don't need a little bit of the dark to make any colour darker. Cern it. Again, slightly darker than these, but on a par really with the souffle. And then the soft. Look how much darker this is than these ones. And then the professional. Again, very similar to the soft. So I think that highlights quite clear, particularly on the workshop that I was talking about when most people were using Primo and I was using the Fimo Soft, how I needed to really change the proportions of my colour um, when I was trying to make different shades. And it's worth bearing that in mind when you're following tutorials online or in books as well, that if you're using a different brand of clay and your colour mixes aren't coming out the same, it's probably not you, it is more likely to be the brand of clay you are using. So don't feel hard on yourself, just change the colours up Add a bit more white, add less dark, and see how that works as you go along. So for today's session, we don't need very much clay at all. So I'm just going to use half a pack of white and half a pack of black. So across the board in all the different brands of clay. So it's effectively about one ounce of white and one ounce of black. And I'm going to condition it, conditioning the white first, obviously, so it um, doesn't get dirty in the pasta machine. And put it through pasta machine on a medium thin setting. So I've put all this through on setting number five on my machine and on my machine zero is the thickest setting and nine is the thinnest and all I've done is I've used my measuring sheet and I've just cut out two two inch squares or five centimeter squares of the white same with the black and then three half of those so two and a half centimeters by five centimeters or one inch by two inches and then just a couple little extra bits you'll have more than that left over from your half pack but that's all you're going to need um, for today's clay. Now normally you know me I wouldn't measure it out quite this precisely the only reason I've done this is because I'm doing exactly the same across all six brands of clay so it's easier for me to do it in these set sizes and pieces so if you're doing it at home you don't need to be this precise but you can be obviously if you want to. So the first thing I'm going to do is a Skinner blend so I'm going to take one piece of the white and one piece of the black and because I've got it nicely sorted and because this is Fimo Soft I'm going to be working in to start with um, and I'll say I will do the same with all of them because as you know um, we need a lot more of the white in this um, to get a nice mix. I have just slanted it slightly at one end so that when I put those two bits together because of that being offset I will have a little bit of white left at this end and all black at that end with a mix between the two. Now I'm not going to go into great details doing the Skinner blend if you need any more information on how to do Skinner blends I do have a video showing you how to do that and I'll put a link to that um, in the details below this video but effectively as always the Skinner blends I'm just folding this in two um, for me simply because I haven't rolled it so it's going to keep it nicely together and I'm going to put it back through the pasta machine down that way and because this was on setting number five I'm going to go up a couple of settings um, make thicker because I've now got four layers of clay so for me that'll be on setting number three so I'll bring you back when I've got a nice blend of this clay. So here we have our blend of clay, so all I'm going to do is just going to fold that in half and then I'm going to put it back through the pasta machine on the setting I'm on at the moment, so setting number three, black end first to give myself a longer strip. And now I'm going to put it back through on my thinnest usable setting, which for me is number nine, black end again first to give myself a longer strip. Um, if you aren't sure whether your machine's going to shred the clay by putting it down to the thinnest setting straight away, just go down one setting at a time until you get your thinnest usable setting. So there we go, not a particularly long piece because we're not using very much clay today. But all I'm going to do now is I'm just going to concertina it just from one end to the other. And I'm actually doing quite a thin, narrow concertina here. So probably about um, a third of an inch, just about one centimetre across. Just going backwards and forwards, folding it, trying to make sure I'm not trapping too much air in those folds at the sides as we go through. Once we've got it done, I'm just going to flatten it slightly, neaten off the edges, and then I'm going to take my knitting needle 
and just create a groove in the white side. Remember those tiny little extra bits of clay we had? I was going to take a little bit of that, not very much, probably about pea-sized. Give it a roll and then just slot it into the, the top there and then the reverse on the other side. So where I put the um, black into the white clay, here I'm going to use the white into the black clay. So about the same, about pea-sized bit. It doesn't really matter too much this bit as to what size you put in, but just something that's going to sit nicely inside your groove. And then we're just going to pinch it up, create more of a triangular shape. And then I'm just pulling it along, along the bottom end and my triangle is going to be with the black being the point at the top. I'm going to make this to about two inches in length and then I'm going to chop it into two. Okay, so that's the first element of our cane done and what I'm now going to do is I'm going to do exactly the same in all the other five brands of the clay. And when I've done that, I'll come back and do the next session in this one for you. Okay, so I've now done that with the other five brands and what I've done is I've worked through them in a certain order and I'll continue to work through everything in the same order so that there's the same amount of rest time between each of the clays so that I will have as near um, perfect conditions for all of them as each other. We're now going to make a very simple um, cane. We're going to take the remaining square of the two by two two inch by two inch and we're going to push it together to create a log of clay make it sort of stub ended make it about an inch wide and then chop down the, the middle fold the two pieces open and then with a knitting needle create a groove down both of them this time we're going to fill in one side. So again, either with a little of your off piece of black or take a little bit from um, the, other, the other two inch square. Same thing again. Make a little roll, put it in the middle and this time put the two pieces back together. So effectively you've created a nice round space for that to go in the middle. And then we're going to wrap this in black but not the whole way around. So use a, your blade and I'm going to go past where the join is to make sure the join is nicely encased. Bring it all the way around but as I say not quite to the top because I want a bit of white showing through. Okay and then as before I'm just going to make this into a triangular shape just by pinching in the top and pressing down. But this time we want this to only be one inch in height so if it's got too long just press it in slightly as you go around each side. So we end up with a cane that's like that that's about one inch across this way in length. So I'm going to do exactly the same now with the other five brands and I'll bring you back when I've done that. Okay, so they're all done, done that with all six. So the next thing we're going to do, we're going to make effectively like a little border cane, a nice sort of checkerboard, but in a stripe effect, just to give a bit of movement through our kaleidoscope cane. So I've taken two of the smaller pieces of the white and the black, and I'm actually going to layer up the black and the white relatively neatly, back on my measuring sheet, so that I can then chop them in two and layer them up, chop them in two again and layer them up. So I now have a nice stripe. So what I need to do now is if I can I'm going to chop that piece into four even pieces and for me I would find it easier to chop in half to start with and then half again and half again. Because what we're then going to do is we're going to take our piece of black and lay these on top. I 
and because we're doing a one inch high cane they are already nicely in one inch height to take off the excess of the black and then this side we're going to do this put the white over the front put that down there I'm going to take it up turn it over take off the excess of the white and then all I'm going to do is I'm going to press it in to make sure it's nicely adhered I don't want to roll it because I don't want to make it stretch any longer that way in fact I'm going to push it slightly in because what I'm going to do is I'm just going to push it slightly longer that way so we've got a piece that's going back to what we started with it's roughly two inches by one inch in height and as before I'm going to do exactly the same now with all the other brands of clay so there we go there's the six brands all with their little bits made up um, and that's all we're going to do so it's very simple um, individual canes for the little kaleidoscope cane we're going to make out of black and white so as before I'll start with the female soft and then work my way around all the others until I've got each of them put together in a triangular cane so here are our canes in the female soft plus the last bit of black and white that we hadn't yet used and we're going to put these together in a very simple triangular format so I'm going to use the points um, so that's going to be a point going out for one corner of the triangle that's going to be a point for another and then let's orientate that one something like that way and then we're going to use this to thread between them so let's do a little sort of bit of a curve on so we could take perhaps have it coming out this side and going around like that so I'm just sort of making it up as I go along just sort of adding something in which case we've got a little triangular bit we need to add in here and a triangular bit we need to add in here so that's very dark to dark so I think we'll add a bit of white in here so I'm just going to roll up my bit of my white clay and create a little triangular sh shape I'm not too worried about there being black on my hands or on the outside of the clay because as I say it's going towards dark sides there now it's not quite an equilateral triangle right? so it's a longer eclipse shape so what I'm going to do is I'm going to press down on that to make more of an eclipse shape and then I'm just with my tissue blade going to chop off the top and bottom because you usually find that the middle of the shape gives a better shape so that can now sit on the edge of there and he can now pull in around there and then we're going to do something similar on this side this is much more of a triangular shape so again just rolling up that little piece of black giving it a roll and then creating a triangular shape and because we're just creating a simple triangular shape this one I can press down on the bottoms to make it nice and flat so we don't want too much don't need too much in the way of height so I'll put him over there put those two back and we're now creating quite a nice triangular shape however we've got a bit of a gap here and a bit of a gap there so we should still have our little bits of leftover clay from our packs so I'm going to put a bit of white probably this one and a bit of black in that one and again I'm just going to create little triangular shapes to fill in the gaps And because that's wider that way, I'm just using my fingers, pulling out the back whilst keeping a point. So that will fit in there, take off the excess. So he will fit in there. And then we'll do a little bit for the black. But that's a longer triangle. So I'm going to press down again with my fingers to flatten that out quite broad as before you can pull the ends out make it really quite broad so that when he sits in he'll just pop in there and then it's up to you I might just add a little bit of black down here and a little bit of white down there just to add a bit of contrast so again these little pieces we've got roll them out a piece of the white there roll in and then with my knitting needle just create a groove 
and sit that in, pinch off the excess. And the same with this one, just create a groove. So we've just added a bit of interest to those extra colours we've created. Okay, so I'm not going to do any more of this one just at this stage, simply because I want to now put all other five brands together in exactly the same way so I can see what I end up with. But once I've done all five of those, I'll bring you back and we'll start reducing this and putting it into a proper kaleidoscope cane. So here we are with all six done at the same stage. Um, you can see there, they're all very, very similar. Um, but I can tell you that working with them, the Kato was the firmest to work with and to my mind it's kept the shape more readily. The souffle was the softest and that's become quite distorted already but both the souffle, souffle and the primo very nice and easy to work with on the hands. The professional um, which again was one of the firmer clays actually was relatively soft to work with and the cernet I don't think this um, test is going to be a true reflection of the cernet to be honest because it just so happens that the packs I used of that were particularly firm and I know it's usually a lot softer and more pliable straight out of the packet but I will persevere mainly because I haven't got any more um, packs so I can't sort of swap around um, but I'll bear this in mind because cernet's usually nicer to work with than the, um, the packets that I'm actually using today but it still is kept a very nice shape. So having done all that the next thing to do is to start reducing all these down. So I'll start by reducing the Fimo Soft and I'm just going to work on it in that triangular pattern just forcing it even more triangular as I go so we end up with a nice equilateral triangle. So I'm just pushing it in with my fingers to start off and then I'll start working. I'm not going to work on the measuring sheet to start with because I find it slips around too much. But when I've got it till it's about one inch across each of these sides, then I'll start moving onto the measuring sheet to make sure I have a nice equal equilateral triangle. So let's just work our way through that. So all I'm doing when I'm reducing is I'm just pushing in whilst at the same time pulling ever so slightly longer. Just turning it round as I go. Nice even pressure even pressure all the way around. Every so often if the ends become distorted, you can see there where it's starting to um, change shape, I will just press down to even those out and then we'll go back. It will also be interesting to see when we do this comparison how dirty the whites get. Now with Fimo the black does transfer quite quickly and easily onto your fingers and as you can see here I'm not working on a tile I'm working straight onto um, a tabletop because it doesn't react with the polymer clay but however is already leaving marks so I will also contrast that with the other clays as we go. But keep working down just pressing in every so often turn it around the other way because I have a tendency probably like a lot of people that I start off quite firm at this end of the cane and by the time I get to this end I've probably got slightly less pressure in my fingers. So let's see how we're doing because we haven't got a lot of size here so we're not getting too far off already so I'm just going to put this up using this back line so I can see how far over I've got. I'm just going to press in and keep going down until I end up with a nice equilateral cane. And you'll notice when I'm doing this, when I'm doing it at this stage, in the finishing stage, I'm only actually pressing just at the very bottom of the cane. Because if you do it each time, and when I say the bottom, my fingers are actually going into the bottom, but probably this part of my finger is almost reaching up to halfway. So I'm actually doing a nice even reduction, even though it looks as though I'm not touching all of the cane. So I'll just flip him over again. So we're getting close. Every so often if you feel that the middle's bulging out slightly, you can do that. So we're pretty close now. The other thing I'm looking for when I get to this stage is because I've got a nice um, even cane, so we're doing the one inch cane here, I'm also looking to make sure that this top line, this point, is actually along the middle. So it's not going one way or other. So it's nice even cane with the point nicely placed along the middle. I 
I'm just going to pull it directly towards me for a minute or two so I can just double check that it's nicely positioned and I'll bring you back when I know I've got each side exactly the same and it's really nicely the point is positioned over the top of that on each side. Okay, having done that now, and it's much easier to do it when you're looking right over the top of the cane, I've got it as even as I can, so I'm just going to take off one slice from the end and I'm going to work on the piece where there's not any distortion, so I'm going in from the end all the way up to about here. Taking one chop down through. So, having got it to that stage, it's the first time we're going to see what the pattern's going to look like. So I've done that with the Fimo Soft and now I'll do it with all the other ones as well. So there we go, all six done, all six sliced off and all six looking pretty good I'd have to say. And it just goes to prove that certainly with something as small as this size of kaleidoscope cane you can get good results with every single brand of clay no matter how soft or firm they are. Personally, I think the one that's come out best at this stage, and I'll show you more when I put them together so it'll make it more clear, is unsurprisingly the Kato. It is the firmest of the clays, but when you put your pieces together, it will give you a really good pattern and it just keeps the pattern perfectly. It is, however, very firm and therefore very hard to reduce. And if you've got any problems with your hands, then perhaps one of the other clays may be better. Now I would have thought the Fimo Professional, being another firm clay, would probably be given the next best results, but in actual fact, I'd have to say I was very surprised, pleasantly surprised, by the Sculpey Primo. Now again, I think that's given a very nice result um, when you put the pieces together, and again, I will show that when we put all the pieces together and start kaleidoscoping them properly. The softest clay was the Sculpey Souffle to reduce and to work with, but it has given the most distortion in the finished pattern. So the others, all of them, I'd be very happy to work with. And um, as I said, the Cernit, I think slightly um, not a good representation because the clay I was using was particularly hard, but again, it, it, it reduced very well, it's worked very well. The other thing um, to mention is that um, passing of the black on your hands. The worst two were the Fimos, not surprisingly. Cernit was very good, both these Sculpeys were very good, and Kato not too bad. But one thing I have learnt, tip technique, um, when you're using the Fimo, if you are, doesn't matter if you've got any other colours, but with the, um, the light yellows and the white, before you put your bits together, just very gently go down. So can you see the difference where I've actually wiped a bit as to non-wiped. Now don't do that just before you're about to take your slices, do it and then leave it for a little bit, but you can actually wipe off the dirt and that will give you a much, much nicer, neater mix when you put them all together. One of the other things I have noticed, both through watching other people in workshops and my own experience, is that the Fimos do stick to the pasta machines a lot more and they get clogged up in the pasta machines and you have to clean your pasta machine much more often than if you're working with the Sculpeys. The Kato is pretty good and the Cernet again pretty good. Um, it doesn't and won't stop me using Fimo but it is something again to be aware of when you're working in it, and it is one of the differences. But for me it does really hone the fact that if you're doing a complicated cane then Kato really is um, a very good polymer clay to use. So what we're going to do now is we're going to start taking individual slices off our canes. So there we go, there's the six finished um, kaleidoscopes all put together in their stripes and I think hopefully you'll agree they all look pretty good. Um, the other thing that's quite funny is I have been able to put one slice of each together and even together they make a not too bad match um, for a little kaleidoscope piece. Although they're very similar, one thing that does strike me sort of quite obviously is the, the Cernit and the Fimos, which of course have the much darker centre um, and you've got a much better blend in the Sculpey Primo and the Cato Poly Clay of the Skinner blends. You've got that nice softer sort of greys coming through. Um, but other than that, so I, to my mind, still the Cato Poly Clay gives the best overall pattern and the clearest, sharpest results, but they're all pretty good. I'd be happy with any of those. So I'm going to carry on working with the um, Fimo Soft to put this together to create a little pendant and also to show you the other patterns that you can get because obviously this is only one way of putting the all six slices together. There are two other ways to get two other patterns. So I'll do the other patterns in the Kato to show you because they'll say that's the one that gives the best overall design and I'll put use the Fimo Soft to put together to do the pendant. So here I've done the 
other patterns of the same cane. So this is the one obviously we did with all of them and then these, if you put it together, different combination, those are the other two patterns that you get. So I think for the pendant I'm going to do today, I'll choose these sort of two patterns. So I'll go and get some slices of the Fimo Soft and show you how to put them together so we can make some nice patterns to create a lovely pendant for today's project. So here I've cut my 12 slices and I did them off camera because when I cut, I actually cut. So I'm looking right over the top to make sure I got nice neat slices and obviously all you'd see then is the top of my head. So I've already cut those. Um, and I've just got a little piece of, this is just um, the baking parchment, the sort of stuff you'd put in the oven. And I cut these into small squares because I find it quite easy to put my pieces together doing that. So when I'm taking my slices, I'll take two at a time because I know that if I put those two back to back, They'll join together like that. And I'm going to put them together, carefully matching up as I go with all the patterns and making sure that it all fits together. And then go from this side round to there. And see, I'm just really easing it together, making sure that all the patterns are fitting together nicely. Put it down flat and then I will check using the blunt side of my tissue blade and if it's not quite straight, then you can just press it straight. And now I'll repeat for the other three pieces. Then because I'm working on something like this, I can actually hold this up, fold this piece over so that I can put these two pieces together really nicely and e evenly. Put that into the middle and then reverse on the other side. So I'm really concentrating on making sure that all these patterns match up. There we go. Next thing I'm going to do is just take the blunt side of the knitting needle here and very gently I'm just going to roll down each of those joins. Rolling from the outside towards the middle. I'm just making sure that they're nicely joined together. When I've done all six, I will take my roller and again, working from the outside towards the middle, go around each of the flat sides. Having done all six on that side, carefully leave your piece off, making sure it's nice clean underneath. Fold over and do exactly the same on the reverse. I will nearly always end up on the side I started because you have a tendency to put this side together slightly better. If there's any inconsistencies in the height of the slices, they will normally be on the underside rather than on the top. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to straighten out the sides because I want to make sure this is as even a pattern as you can get. So I'm just straightening the sides out. I'm just using the blunt side of my tissue blade and then I will have a really good look at it because these two sides should be parallel. I should those, I should those. And I'm just going to look at the pattern as well to see if it's even all the way around or if it needs pulling out. Now I think this side needs to be pulled out just a fraction here. So have a good look round, change your position, keep going around. Because what we're looking to get is as even a piece as we possibly can. When we're happy with it, take your cutter and with any luck, it'll just about be perfect size to fit round because I don't want to lose too much of the pattern so only just losing the corners is fine on this. So I'll spend a bit of time, make sure it's nice and even and if, as on this one, it's slightly small, I'm just going to very gently roll both sides just to extend it ever so slightly. 
Having placed the circular cutter nice and squarely in the middle of my piece, I'm just going to take a board, just because the top of this um, cutter is quite sharp, and just use that press down. And now I should be able to pull all the excess bits away and have a nice piece that we're going to use to create our pendant. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to peel off my piece of clay from the mat, put it nice and centrally on one of these domes. And with the size I've got, that should fit down to the bottom all the way around, creating a nice dome of the clay. Once that's pressed into place, I'm going to repeat exactly the same, but with this pattern version, so putting it together in a slightly different way. Put that on the corresponding dome here, so I end up with two half domes. And then we'll bake that according to the manufacturing instructions for the brand of clay you are using. Once your pieces are baked and cooled from the oven, I've just flipped these off the tray and then on in a sink with a little bit of um, washing up liquid, um, detergent liquid, and all I've done is I've just laid them smooth and just sanded them so I've given them a bit of a, a flat bottom to each of my pieces and then put them up to make sure that very roughly they do match in size. We are then going to take a last little bit of our clay. Now hopefully you should have enough to be able to put that back through on setting number five, the same setting we've been working on all the way through. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take, take the cutter I used to cut out these pieces, which is now very slightly bigger, and I'm just going to cut a circle. Leave that flat on your sheet. I'm then going to cut an inner circle, as evenly as you can get it, Not, don't worry too much. Now there are loads of different ways of doing um, hollow polymer clay beads, this is just one of the ways that I've developed over the years. Um, but leaving that flat on the surface, I'm going to get a little bit of liquid clay, and this is a just decanted um, from a larger pot because I find it easier to use decanted. Going to Go that round on our inner circle there. And then I should be able to take one of my pieces and just lay it on top of that ring of clay. Take your tissue blade, lift up the whole thing, and you should be able to turn it over, repeat on the other side, so a little bit of liquid clay. So I'm holding the centre of the baked bead. Try and make sure the ring doesn't fall off. It's a little bit tricky, but it's worth it because it gives a very nice finish. And then you should be able to put that half on top. And then press down. And what you want to do, you want to look over the top to make sure that they're nice and evenly sitting on top of each other. You should then be able to press down to adhere those two circular pieces together. And when you're happy, just go around, trim off the excess clay with your tissue blade. Good feel around, make sure it's nicely sat together. And there you've got your two pieces nicely sandwiched by a small thin piece of polymer clay. If you wanted to um, put a hole through this, you could do it at the moment by using a beading needle. 
So if you wanted to have it so you'd bead all the way straight through, then you'd sort of twist and put a hole there. So at this stage, all I'm going to look at is see roughly where I think I might want any little screw or hole to go afterwards. See which side, so I'll probably put it up somewhere like that. And all I'm going to do is I'm just going to twist through a tiny hole just so it goes through to the middle, just so that if the air in there expands too much it's not going to blow the two pieces apart, so somewhere for the air to go out. But I don't have to use that later because when it's finished we will sand and polish it and get it nicely done. So that's now going to sit the other way up, back inside the tray, be rebaked again according to the manufacturer's instructions for the brand of clay you are using. And then when it comes out I will sand and polish and create a little hole to put the screw in and that will be our finished pendant. And I will also do exactly the same for all other five brands of the clay. So I'll bring you back when that's finished baking. So here are our six finished domed pendants. And I must admit, I am pretty pleased with all of them. Um, I've used all these clays for a long time, so I knew that they were all good for caning, but it has been interesting doing this comparison and doing exactly the same cane. And it's taught me a few things as well. As expected, um, the best one I found was the Kato for actually keeping the design nice and pristine, but I'm really impressed with the um, Sculpey Primo as well. I think that's kept a really nice design. As expected, the one that sort of distorted most probably was the Fimo Soft. Um, the Cernit and the um, Professional again very well, but also the Souffle, very good. It's, it came out very well. So as you can see, I've actually sanded and polished all of these, all done again exactly the same amount of um, sandpaper, so going from that 240 to 600, 1000, 1500 and 2000, and then I've polished them on my buffing wheel with a nice open cotton mop top as a buffing tool. And so they've all been done apart from the souffle, because of course the souffle, part of its attraction is that it's got this lovely sort of um, suede effect finish. However, I was curious, so I have actually polished the other side, just to show you that you can sand and polish it in exactly the same way as the others as well. Other things on the sanding and polishing, um, I'm sure a lot of you know this, but the hardest one to do and the toughest one to sand was the Kato. Um, the easiest one to sand was the Fimo Soft. Um, and that's again one of the reasons why I'd still like using the Fimo Soft. The others very much the same, um, so not a lot to choose between any of them. One other thing to note, which um, has struck me as quite interesting, is the Kato. You can probably see quite clearly here, one of the things that is known about Kato is that the whites can discolour um, in the oven and take on this brownie tinge, and you can see here it's definitely taken on a brown tinge. But what I found interesting about this one is I have used white Kato poly clay and yet some of it has discoloured and some of it hasn't. And the other thing, I don't know if you can see very clearly in here, if I bring this up close to the camera, can you see even on these small bits here, I've obviously used two different packs of clay um, and mix them together. So that's going to, I'm going to do a bit more research on that to try and figure out whether there's something about the, the type of clay, whether it was a mix of clay. All my Kato um, poly clay is new, so it's all come through. It may well be that I mix more than one different batches, so maybe a batch was different. But you might think, well, is it just because it's in the centre? But when you turn over, it's that same cane, which is now on the outside, which has got that slight discoloration on it. So that was interesting. So some of it stayed nice and white, but some of it just did discolour. And I've never had that before, not on the same piece, so I say I definitely need some more research. Um, as far as putting them all together in the forms, they all came together very well. They'd say they've all sat together well. I think it really does come down to the fact of use whichever clay you feel more comfortable with. I started with Fimo Soft, that's where my heart probably still lies to a certain extent. I will carry on using Fimo Soft. I also have more stock of Fimo Soft than anything else, which is another reason why I'll carry on using it. Complex canes, I definitely go for Kato if I'm doing something really complex. But I do quite complex ones in my dragons and my dragon wings, and I do those out of the um, Scarpy Primo, so I will carry on doing those. Cernit, I think, came out very well, as, as did the professional. So, whatever you've got, carry on using. I enjoyed that tutorial. I hope the actual kaleidoscope cane will give you some fun. And I think the answer is just have confidence in whichever brand you're using because they all cane really well.
So I think that's it for now. As I say, I hope you enjoyed watching the video. I enjoyed doing it for you. Thank you as always for those of you who subscribe. It really does mean a lot to me um, and I appreciate all the comments that people make as well on the videos. And one of the reasons, again, I've done this video is because people kept asking me why I used different brands of clay and the simple answer was I, because I do use all of them. I use them for different things depending on what project I'm undertaking. So that's it for now and hopefully I'll see you next time. Thanks so much for watching. Bye.